Hello everyone, this is Mel here from Sneakers Corner. Hello to Dragon Denarius and XYZ and anyone else who's watching and anyone who will be watching later. Um, so, um, what am I looking at this evening? Um, hard to explain really. Um, if you've been following Thomas Alexander's videos on Fander Films over the last few weeks, which have been fantastic, um, you may have seen one of these videos recently, which spoke about the Dome of the Rock and gave the alternative explanation to the reference to Muhammad on the rock inscriptions and suggested that actually they're not about Muhammad at all, but about Jesus. And this isn't something entirely new. Um, Murad had mentioned that a, a year ago, um, but I thought um, Thomas Alexander's explanation was particularly brilliant. And uh, so what we're going to look at is we're going to have a look at that video first, just in case you haven't seen it. I'll just show you a few minutes of it. Hello to Faye there. See you there. Um, so we're going to have a look at that just in case you haven't seen it and just kind of bring it fresh to mind. And then what I'm going to explore is the idea, well, if if that is true, if if in the 7th century, particularly in the Dome of the Rock, they were using the word Muhammad originally to refer to Jesus, as, and it basically started off on the rock inscription, primarily, not 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 completely, but um, as a reference to um, "Blessed be He," you know, um, or "Blessed be," a bit like Benedictus, um, and then it, it it evolved. Well, if if that time it you know the the pro, proto I'm saying it badly here, but if proto-Islam gradually evolved from a focus on Jesus to one of a focus on Muhammad, the, the Arabian prophet, then what you would expect is that accompanying that would be a borrowing from the older tradition into the new tradition and a distortion of the, that borrowing. So one of the suggestions I had was a piece of art from the 14th century and I basically thought out loud I said well you could imagine that that may have been influenced by something from earlier times that they basically just reworked over the centuries until it became unrecognizable and so that was a post I don't know how, how many of you um, saw that I mean, it just it was a comment it was one of those spur of the moment comments it was just a hunch and uh and, I, you know, it was a level zero. You know, it was one of those thinking out loud sort of moments. It wasn't meant to be taken too seriously. But it is sort of serious at one level in that you kind of, if 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 Thomas is correct that, you know, it started out as an anti-Trinitarian sect, which I actually do buy, I think that's, that's a very good way of explaining it. And then it gradually evolved, you know, with the Abbasids into a movement that was, Islam, essentially, um, then you'd expect that there would be evidence of the kind that I'm going to show you, which is that things got tweaked, taken from Christianity, including art, brought into the new tradition, and then it became unrecognizable. So that's <laughs> was meant to be a short introduction, became a long introduction. Let me just start by showing you this video from... Um, The other day, uh, just be a few, just show you a few minutes of it, just so you get the idea, and then we'll come back. As you just, just said, Jay, we're going to look uh, at the inscriptions inside the Dome of the Rock today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, put side by side the original inscription, and then next to it, I've got Christoph Luxemburg's translation, who um, obviously uses his approach. Um, with, with looking also at the Aramaic origins to, to translate the inscription. Though it's actually fairly similar to what uh, any standard translation will say. Um, so, and let's start right at the beginning. Um, the first verse says, in the name of the gracious and merciful God, there is no God but God alone. He has no associate. To him belongs sovereignty and to him belongs praise. He gives life and makes people die, he's almighty. So this is the 
sort of the, the bismillah, the, the uh, a, a doxology, or if you will, like it's, um, yeah, well, praising the one God. Um, then now it, now it gets interesting. So in the second verse, it starts with this uh, line, Muhammadun Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu, which Christoph Luxemburg translates as praise be the servant of God and his messenger. Now, traditionally, obviously, Muslims do not like this translation. They will say it says, well, Muhammad is the servant of God and his messenger. But Christoph Luxemburg argues that actually at the beginning, this Muhammadun can only be read as a gerundival participle, so grammatically, because it, uh, as he says, it refers to the third line um, that you see here. So this, to him belongs sovereignty and to him belongs praise. So the last bit there, we see lahu lahamdu, which if you look at it here, I'm going to use my mouse here. That's this part, which looks awfully similar to this part here, which is the Muhammadun. That's because it's the same root. Um, it's uh, to him belongs praise and below we have praise be. And if you um, put those two into context, because um, Luxburg argues that it can only be a gerundible participle, so it's not a name, it's praise be. Um, yeah, so let's continue. So we praise be the servant of God and his messenger. God and his angels bless the prophet. O you who believe, implore God's blessing and grace upon him. God bless him and may there be God's grace and mercy upon him. All right. Um, so at this point, I could, you could even, you could still probably say that, well, yeah, well, it might still talk about this uh, prophet Muhammad, but, but not one thing. So we, we've here this praise be the servant of God and his messenger, or Muhammad is the servant of God, his messenger. Um, and then God bless his angels, bless, bless the prophet. So the next, uh, so God and his angels bless the prophet. And then afterwards, we never hear of Muhammad again. All right, so now we're going, going, going through the rest of the inscription, and it's all about Jesus. And then you see it really makes sense in the context that this is not talking about a prophet Muhammad. This is talking about a blessed one, the blessed prophet Jesus. So in the next verse we have, for oh, people of the scripture, do not go astray in your exegesis and do not tell anything but the truth about God. For verily the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, is the messenger of God and his word, or Logos, which he has infused into Mary along with his spirit. All right, so now here we have this slide which says, Jesus is the messenger of God. All right, so first we had, blessed be the messenger of God, and now it clarifies who this messenger is in the, in the very next verse. And it's Jesus. So believe in God and his messengers and do not just say three. Cease doing that, it would be better for you. For verily, God is a unique God. May he be praised. How could he then have a child? Rather, all belongs to him that is in the heavens and on earth. For God alone is sufficient as a helper for mankind. So again, it's only talking about Jesus. It's talking about Christology. It's talking about though not don't say three. Uh, he's just a prophet basically this is what we see later on in chapter 4 verse 171 which could be an antecedent to chapter 4 verse what became chapter 4 171 in the current quran yeah so um actually I'm currently reading something by um Raymond Descartes well he has a french name but he's actually also a german scholar and he argues that actually the dome of the rock was sort of an inspiration for some things that would then later get into the quran yeah. Um, so that these that large parts of the crown were written under the Abbasids, which I mean we already know, but that they also in, included Umayyad elements in there. Okay. Now, um, next, the Messiah would not disdain to be God's servant, nor would the angels standing near to God. Whoever disdains it. However, to serve him and himself behaves haughtily, such people he will one day call together in his presence. So again, talking about Jesus. So the Messiah would not disdain to be God's servant. So he's the servant of God. He's not God. Um, he himself would say so. Oh God, bless your messenger and servant Jesus, son of Mary. So again, we have 
Jesus being the messenger and the servant. Um, again, referring to this, the first um, slide we've looked at where it says, praise be, uh, yeah, your messenger. Praise be upon him on the day on which he was born, on the day on which he will die, and on the day on which he will be resurrected. So this would be an antecedent to chapter 19, verse 33. 19, yes, exactly. <clears throat> Um, yeah, such is Jesus, son of Mary, the word of truth, about whom you fight with one another. So now this is referring to this, these Christological divisions that were within the, um, this caliphate when Abdul Malik came in, right? So we had all those different Christianities who were fighting each other. So he wants to put an end to it with his new um, religion, or well, actually this old religion in this case. Um, yeah. Um, so going on, it does not become God to adopt a child. May he be praised. When he decides something, he only needs in this regard to say be, and it comes into be. God is my Lord and your Lord to so serve him. This is a straight line. And again, this is also what we see in the Quran in um, Surah 40, 43, 64, and in 5, 117. But I mean, as you see, it's all about Jesus and Christology everything so there's no more mention of any any prophet muhammad it's all about jesus so we can it's clear that this initial line it ref, also refers to jesus it is it says praise be um the servant of god okay it's all about jesus <laughs> it's pretty clear i think um thomas did an excellent job there okay now i'm gonna share my PowerPoint with you. And we're just going to take it from there. Okay, let's see how this works. Um, now, so bearing that in mind, you can see from the rock inscription now having reinterpreted in actually a much more logical fashion than I think has ever been done before. Um, we can see that what's going on in the seventh century is Abdul al-Malik represents an anti-Trinitarian point of view. And he's basically trying to end the squabbles among the Christian sects and saying, no, this is this is the line that we're going to hold. Jesus is just a servant of God. He's not God. So don't say three and so, so on. Okay? That's, there is Muhammad in the 7th century in terms of the rock inscription. It's not who we thought it was. It's not uh, an Arabian prophet. It's just Jesus. Okay, it's just been misinterpreted, uh, mistranslated. Okay, so so that's the kind of like the the background to where I'm going. So, could an earlier piece of Christian art about Jesus evolve over the centuries into a reimagined piece about Muhammad? And of course, this is just a thought experiment because th this is the sort of thing we would expect to happen if our interpretation of the rock inscription is correct. We would expect this sort of thing to happen. So this is not um, solid, really, uh, but it's just like seeing, um, is there um, any evidence that would suggest that there was a parallel evolution in art? Okay, so that's the idea, at least, okay? Now, let me just move on to the next slide. So that was the, the line. So this is the bit that I shared yesterday. I said... This familiar image was done in 1307. In it, Muhammad places the black rock onto a rug lifted by four of his companions. However, if Muhammad referred originally to Jesus before the tradition went off in a different direction, then perhaps the origin of this visual motif could be Jesus giving his gospel to the four evangelists. What do you think? Crazy idea or plausible? Uh, just throwing it out there as an idea so what when i shared this i had no idea if there was i just literally just thought that it could be and that the key some of the key elements in this may have been inspired by something earlier that was quite similar okay so what are the key elements i would suggest well you have the figure of muhammad which could have been jesus originally um you have four key individuals in this case they're holding a rug Okay, so you have those two. There's two in the background, but they're not as important. Really, it's the four that are important. They're the ones holding the rug, and 
Muhammad is holding something it appears to be a black rock. Now, this is obviously from the later tradition. OK, and that's where I left it. And I was just like a crazy idea. What do you think? And I didn't think much of it. And today I found something. And uh, this is what this is the reason why I uh, did this video, which I think might be of interest. OK, so this is called the Rabula Syriac uh, Gospels from 586 AD. So it's at the right time frame. OK, it's very early illuminated gospel. You can see the cover there of the gospel. It's in Syriac. OK, so you can see the Syriac writing. So it's basically in the right place. OK, you can see there's four individuals and this is meant to be Jesus in the center. OK, this is, you can see there's a lot of parallels between the two, a lot of similar motifs. OK, um, one of the things that you will notice is there's a backdrop. It seems to be like a building in the background to the figure of Jesus here. And you can see there's like a doorway here. In this case, there's a kind of like a doorway there, except the only difference here is it's rectangular here. It's more oval here. OK, whereas um, it's oval here and it's also rectangular here. OK, so it's. It's almost like a Kaaba that Jesus is is connected to in a way, in a way. OK, um, so it's better not to read too much into it, but let's have a look at it in a little bit closer detail. So uh, as far as I can tell, these four are meant to represent the four evangelists. Um, and Jesus is giving what seems to be a scroll to them. And I think this represents Jesus giving the gospel to them. And from that gospel, they have produced their four gospels. That's how I read it. Now, I may be wrong. This is just looking at it visually and assuming that this is what's happening. I could it could be completely wrong here, um, but it seems like that. Um, now, could, I stand corrected. It could it be that this represents justinian or someone it may be and then so obviously my theory might be completely out the window um but um that's how i would interpret the fact there's a halo there and there's not a halo around these might suggest that this is meant to be referring to jesus and it's in a gospel so i think it's a fair chance that that's who it's on about okay now what's interesting is the two guys on either side seem to be holding up a rug can you see that the red Rug, and it's Jesus that's sitting on the rug, okay, or a blanket, or a, yeah, something like that. At first glance, I just thought, well, maybe it's just he's sitting on a cushion, but it seems like he's um, sitting on a rug and they're kind of holding it up. And so, what's interesting, if we compare that to the other one, you have the rock in the rug, whereas here you have Jesus sitting on the rug, okay, and Jesus is. In the gospel is considered to be the cornerstone and here instead of jesus you have the rock the black rock the cornerstone that actually literally is in the corner of the kaaba so i'm suggesting that perhaps this is what might have happened okay this is another close-up there it's purely speculative um share what you think i'm going to come back to you all now um let me see if i can just come out of this um, flying carpet says sergeant grinch <laughs> uh, right um um okay you're on to this mel with abraham as you theorize was the forerunner of islam that was the anti-trinitarians possibly red wolf yeah um i think it was close but i think um I think I prefer Thomas's explanation, actually. Um, it's probably in the same ballpark, actually. But um, um, I'm going to just take... Um, actually, there's a few points here. Let me just try and go back a little bit and just see. Um, uh, okay, we'll start with this one here. R Rob Christian says it's copied almost word for word from a Syriac prayer. Um, I presume you mean the Quran, is it? Or do you mean um, the rock inscription? Um, probably you mean the rock inscription. Um, now, what's the etymology of name for Jesus in Quran, i.e. Isa, Asa? Um, 
Have you look having looked into that? Um God, it must be two years ago. They have found the, the particular spelling of Isa in different parts of Syria. Um, I think they found six locations with it. Um, so that's all I know. Um, I've got that information from, uh, what's his name, Al Jalad, uh, through an intermediary. Um, so he's, he, he being the expert in the rock inscriptions. I did have uh, a map with the different locations on it. And if I can find it, I may show it to you later. Um, I've also heard the theory that it's it's the spelling is particularly um, Mandaic Aramaic, which would place it more kind of the spelling you would find sort of southern Iraq. So there you have it. It's kind of a, a mixed bag. It's, it's Iraq or Syria. Take your pick. Um, it's hard to it's hard to know. Um, no. Um, Okay, let's see any other comments. All right. How does, let me see if we can get, oh, sorry, wrong one. Here we go. How does one go about inventing a person? That's a good question. I think it all starts with a wrong interpretation. Um, um, and very often a vacuum um, needs to be filled. Nature abhors a vacuum. So um, I, th I think it must have just built up gradually. Um, you have the figure of Umar, who could have been a major influence on a figure, a heroic figure that could have been built up into the figure of Muhammad. When it exactly started, it's very hard to say because we're trusting on some of the seventh century sources and it's hard to know um, how many of those are really trustworthy because there is a danger that later uh, people might have inserted um, descriptions of Muhammad and so it's really difficult to know um, if you are dealing with legit sources i think you know this is one of the problems with this area and all you can do is your best with the evidence that's there but um anyway i'm going to leave it at that i suppose the idea there with with today's experiment is is to just really test the idea that maybe you could go from christian art to that of an islamic piece of art um carrying over some of the elements and then changing central ones to suit the new agenda, new theology. So you have the central religious leader, Jesus, the, the original Muhammad, if you like, and you have the four evangelists, and he's giving a scroll to them, and they're carrying their their four uh, Bibles or Gospels. I shouldn't say Gospels, really. Um, what else do you have? You had the element of a kind of a rug under him as well, um, and there's a building around Jesus and so on, kind of like a doorway in the background. So those are the key elements in the original piece of art. And then in the the piece of art that comes from the 14th century, so if you think about this, this is centuries and centuries later, so it could have gone through multiple um, stages of evolution through multiple copycat art, you know, over the centuries. And, and obviously th this piece of art, there could have been many variant versions of this as well. So this is just one example of that style of art. Look, Christian art is often replicated in multiple places, you know. Um, so you have, centuries later, something that looks very similar in terms of the motifs in it. So you have a central religious figure of Muhammad. You have the four main people holding up a rug. So you have that rug element again. And um, But instead of the scroll, what you have is the black stone. And instead of that... Uh, curvy building in the background you have a Kaaba in the background because obviously things have changed in the meantime um, so interesting question um, would it be possible to make a step-by-step -step explanation of how it evolved how it started based on all this evidence the best case scenario um, yeah it well it's kind of it, it's pretty much exactly like what happens in the animal world. You know, in the animal world, evolution happens in very tiny steps in small degrees. And if you were to look at it, you'd never notice the difference. So if you can imagine a, a piece of art being copied and replicated down through the generations, each time there's a slight change happening. So, for example, 
the the building in the background could have changed over the centuries you know um the the appearance of the apostles and the appearance of jesus could have changed so jesus could have gone from being sort of like a roman there with short hair and so on to to someone with long hair okay so that's that would be one of the small steps and then perhaps the scroll became a book um or perhaps the scroll became more rounded so you just see the the round end of the the scroll um and then that looks a bit like a rock and and you know you're pretty much there that's three or four steps it doesn't take a huge amount of imagination now this is um what do we call this i think this is called inductive reason if if i'm if not mistaken and you know this is prone to um you know what's this is prone to error because you know you you know our brains are wired to see patterns where there are no patterns you know but i think there's a lot of elements here that are similar um so if we see multiple examples of art like that um which would suggest a kind of a a genre of art where Jesus is in the center and the four evangelists on either side. I think that might suggest that the later artists basically copied that type of artwork. So that's it for today. Thanks for dropping by and talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.